Hi everyone, thanks for joining. So today we're looking at a very interesting subject. So we're going to look over the future of open source vulnerabilities and open source security. So as all of you probably know, open source has been the greatest revolution in the software industry in the last like 10, 15 years. So with the adoption of open source, we also see the hackers understanding. So we adopt the open source, but the hackers are also interested in knowing and exploiting different vulnerabilities. So we're going to look at some trends in the usage of open source. Um, we'll look at the research that we performed in white source that is based on more than 650 um, software developers from all industries, all using open source, and we look at how they treat open source vulnerabilities. So in fact, I work at white source, I'm a product manager, um, and we were also surprised, surprised by some of the things that we saw there. So let's start to look at the perfect. So we have three main topics here, right? The first one is open source vulnerabilities are on the rise. If you're security people, if you're developers, if you're DevOps, you probably know that already. So we see the, the security vulnerabilities and they keep rising as we keep using open source. Now, the second thing is that we want to deliver our software faster. So we want to have continuous delivery. We want to make sure that we give our software as fast as we can to our customers, that they get the best software coverage that they can, but we also need to make sure that we treat security. So with that, we have like the, the main effect of this and the main mindset that I think we need to shift is that we need to integrate security into the life cycle. So the idea of DevSecOps is not really new, but we're going to discuss how to implement that with open source security specifically. So open source vulnerabilities are on the rise. This is not a new thing, but some facts here would be interesting. So from um, about, so about 10, 15 years ago, we can see, and we can see that the software um, open source vulnerabilities, we had many few of them. So we didn't have really a lot. And then we can see 2017, so two years ago, we can see a rise in the open source vulnerabilities. And these, uh, these results, by the way, are from the end of last year. So we really see a big peak here. But it's not all bad, right? We see that there are more security vulnerabilities, which also probably means that we adopt more open source projects, and the hackers know that as well. In addition to that, we see that these vulnerabilities are getting out there, so people hear about them. There are also fixes to them, so it may be easier to handle open source vulnerabilities, but we definitely have a lot of, of them. So we need to understand how to treat them smartly, how to make sure that we integrate them into the pipeline and we integrate the security aspect of actually handling the open source vulnerabilities. And the next aspect is something that we are all aware of. So more than 16, more than 96% of the developers today are actually relying on open source. And most of them in this research, we saw that they're using it in a, on a day by day basis. By the way, these results are from more than 600 companies in all different verticals. So there is no specific vertical. It's not only the software industry, but across all industries and all company sizes. So we all deal with open source. We see that the vulnerabilities are on the rise. So obviously, developers should spend more time on handling and patching these vulnerabilities. And what we see is another good thing. Okay, so around 97% of the actual reported vulnerabilities have an available fix. So what's the problem, right? We have developers, they can patch, they can upgrade the version and just fix everything. And again, this can also be automated, right? We don't need manual intervention. We don't need to make sure that the developers actually research the vulnerabilities, research the patches before they do. Of course we can. So it's a very interesting aspect, but it's not that straightforward. So we have the idea of direct and transitive dependencies. So let's look in the example here. I have an application which has a direct dependency 
to lib1.0, which is a vulnerable library. Okay, so this is my library, and the library has a patch. Okay, so if I upgrade to version 1.1, for example, this will no longer be vulnerable. And this is, by the way, the solution to most of the software vulnerabilities, open source vulnerabilities that we see. Just upgrading and patching it. So with that, we also can look at the idea of smart detection, right? We have many tools such as white source. We have some free tools to actually perform the automation of the detection. But we also need to look at the automation of remediation. Okay, so if I have a developer that is investing a lot of time in actually handling the vulnerabilities, maybe I can do something automatic about that. But we have some more complex um, projects, right? We have my application that is dependent on one other open source project that is actually a dependency of another open source project. And the actual vulnerable library is not in my own code. It's not in an open source that's dependent. It's in a dependency of a dependency. This is what we call transitive dependencies. And in this case, I have to make sure that that vulnerable library is actually patched. So it's not that straightforward, just like handling and, remedi and remediating automat automatically. So how much time do developer, does developers um, perform remediation for fixes. How much time does it take an average developer to handle security vulnerabilities per month, per week? So this is the number that we saw, and I was quite surprised by it. This is the average time, so 15 hours in average, a developer spends on handling security vulnerabilities. Now, it's not all, so not all the time what it does is actually patching and remediating. Actually, about four hours, as you see in red there, is done on actually fixing and patching the vulnerabilities. So where are the other 11 hours? What, what does the developer do in the, other develop, uh, in the other 11 hours? So what they actually do from questions that we ask them, and we try to understand what they do. So what they actually do is they try to understand the vulnerability. They try to prioritize properly. So they look at the severity of the CVE, they look at the business side, they look at which one of them has an available fix, they do the tests, okay, so manual and automated <coughs> tests, and eventually we get to 15 hours a month, which is, in my opinion, a lot more than we need. So we have a very big challenge here, right? We want to ship our software a lot faster than we used to in the past. It's not secure by default. So before my session, if you remember the last session about Docker security, Docker is not secure by default. Kubernetes is not secure by default. Eventually, it had RBAC support only a few versions ago. So nothing is secure by default if you ask the security people. And then, of course, we need to deliver everything faster. But we have the security team's approach, which can be um, a more traditional approach of manual intervention. So whenever you want to choose a new open source project, just speak to me, and I'll verify that it's OK. Whenever you want to implement something new, just speak to me, and I'll verify it's OK. So the security teams become sort of a bottleneck in the fast delivery and the DevOps and the agility that we want to achieve. So this is a great challenge. Um, another approach would be just restricting users from creating objects, whether if it's deploying to uh, Kubernetes clusters or deploying their software, they want to be responsible, and that's OK. So we see a lot of friction between the teams. As we mentioned, the security person wants to make sure that everything is secure. So sometimes they will take the more traditional approach so viewing every resource and making sure that it's actually secure. Then we have the DevOps team. So the DevOps team wants to, wants to deliver the software faster. They want to make sure that the developers have the right tool to actually implement everything faster. And they're also sort of between the two teams, between the security teams and the development teams. And then we have the developers. So the developers actually want to ship new features. They want to deliver more value to the customer. They want to finish their tasks. 
they don't really care eventually about the security issues. And that's what we try to change. So, we spoke about 15 hours a month of handling vulnerabilities. And this is a sort of a mindset shift here. So only some of the reported vulnerabilities are actually being called by your source code. So let's think, think about your big open source project. Um, it can be anything, anything that you use and is widely used in the, in the market. You don't use all the methods in the open source projects. You only use some of them. You maybe use 20% or 30% or 40%. So you have a lot of vulnerabilities, like maybe hundreds or thousands even of vulnerabilities in a big open source project, but not all of them are actually effective. So what if we didn't need to invest so much time in handling vulnerabilities? What if we didn't have to fix all these unnecessary vulnerabilities? Or if we had an automated tool to make sure that we actually invest the time in the vulnerabilities that matter toward the organization. So we have the effective vulnerabilities. The effective vulnerabilities are actually the ones that the proprietary, my proprietary, my source code actually calls. Okay, so these are the effective vulnerabilities. Whereas the non-effective vulnerabilities are the ones that are not being called by my code. I don't need to actually fix them. I don't need to look at them even. Or if I do, maybe because my customers look at the open source components and look at the vulnerabilities, I should do it um, in a much, much lower priority, right? I need to handle first what I can be exploited of. So this is the main idea of open source vulnerabilities. Now again, we looked into this and we looked into our customer base and we looked into the market in general. And we saw that around 30% of the vulnerabilities are actually effective. So we can today find out which of these vulnerabilities are effective and make sure that you handle them first, you prioritize them. And we saw that in the average, this saves around 10 hours per month per developer. So this is, think about all the things that you could do with one developer 10 hours a month. You could develop a lot more software, give a lot more value to your customers. So with that, we have the other idea. So let's say we prioritize automatically. So we have the automatic detection, then we have the automatic prioritization, so we know what we need to actually remediate and take care of. Now we implement all of this into the life cycle. So with the idea of agile and of agile processes, we look at security as a process-driven security management. So no longer like big Excel sheets that stop us from delivering software faster. We want to bake security into the pipeline. We want to make sure that each process that I have in the pipeline, from the selection of the open source project, to the development, to the repository management, and even when I actually deploy the software, I want to make sure that it has automatic detection, and if needed, automatic remediation as well. So let's look at all the processes that we have in the life cycle and make sure that we have open source security implemented into them. So the first step would be smart selection. As a developer, I have a task. I need to choose the right open source project that will help me to deliver the task. So I need to look not only at the functionality, which is what we usually do, but also at three main aspects of open source. So the first one is licensing. Um, I'm not sure if ev everyone here is aware of it, but open source has legal terms, it has licenses, and we need to make sure that the licensing actually matches our company's policy. The second, of course, is vulnerabilities. So at the, at the selection, right at the selection of the open source project, I can look and understand how secure it is, how many vulnerabilities does it, does it have. And then I can also look at the quality. Does it have any open issues? Are the open issues handled properly? Um, how many commits? So stuff like that will actually make sure that I choose the right open source component. And by the way, everything can be done automatically. So you don't have to actually go to the NVD and understand what are the CVEs that are relevant to the open source project. There are automated tools that can do that. The next one is when we look at continuous security, we look at the coding stage. 
So the coding stage has two aspects. The first one is the IDE. So you can get an IDE plugin from uh, one of the marketplaces that will actually show the vulnerabilities as you write the code. So as you write the code, as you can see the, um, the icon here, the orange icon, it actually points to a dependency that is vulnerable. And below that, you can see one of the processes. So one of the processes that we all have as developers is code review process, where someone who is more senior than us or one of our peers in the, in the team actually looks at our code and makes sure, make sure that functionally it's good. It doesn't have any bugs. It, it's good in terms of quality. And what we basically say is that we want to integrate security and open source security also to that process. So think about if in the code review process you could see the number of vulnerabilities that you actually just inserted by, the, by this new commit. And then before you merge the code, you need someone to approve it. So that's basically how it works. That's how we see the coding part. And then let's look at the CI CD. So CI CD is a very um, important process when we look at agile development and we look at software in general. So what we basically say is that you build, you test, and then you deploy. You have all these automated tests, right? In Jenkins, for example. Jenkins, when you build your software, that's a great point to actually pull the automated tests and make sure that they run before you actually <laughs> deliver the software. So an important aspect would be to implement the security in there. So for example, if the code that, you, that you're trying to build has a known CVE, you can automatically fail the build, just as you do with functional um, tests or functional issues or functional bugs. So really we say we need to shift left on the security aspect and make sure that we start as early as we can in handling and both in the remediation of the vulnerabilities. The next aspect is the automated remediation. So one of the things that we can do is to open automated pull requests to actually merge the vulnerable components into, the, into our code. So let's say I have a vulnerable component, and the version is 1.0, as we saw before, and this is a direct dependency. Instead of having a developer looking at the component and understanding what is the right patch, I can have tools to automate the remediation and, and open a pull request automatically with the actual version that fixes the vulnerabilities. So we can do all kinds of automated works in order to make sure that our pipeline is a lot more secure rather than having all the work as manual. Now, the last point is the deployment. So we want to make sure that also in the deployment, we can think about it as a final security gate. So for those of you who are using Kubernetes, for example, and Docker images, you can use the built-in Kubernetes admission controller. So admission controller is a tool, it's a built-in uh, tool inside Kubernetes that makes sure that, um, so it can validate, it has a validating webhook to make sure that something goes, if something goes wrong. So for example, I can validate something and make sure that if there is a known CVE in the software that I'm about to deliver, for example, I want to apply minus F some YAML file that has a known CVE. <coughs> so eventually the admission controller can validate that it has a known CVE and then it can automatically reject it from being deployed into Kubernetes, just as an example. So this is a final security gate. Kubernetes is just an example. You can use it in every um, pipeline that you build. But the idea is, to sh again, to shift security to an early stage in the pipeline and then have the security in each step up to the deployment and treat the deployment as the final security gate. Now, of course, if we did all of that, OK? So we verified everything from the coding stage, from the selection stage, all the way to the deployment, we can still have new security vulnerabilities. Um, so we have new CVEs that are reported every day. So what we need to do, of course, is to continue to monitor our software to make sure that it doesn't have any new CVE or new security vulnerability. 
<coughs> and if it has, so we need to make sure that we can patch as fast as we can. So if you go to the extreme phase, um, you can, for example, have an automated webhook in Jenkins to build the software with the remediated, with the patched code, just as an example. If you're more conservative, you can just get an alert to say, hey, you have a known CVE on this and this machine, this and this pod in Kubernetes, whatever that you're using. So these are two approaches. It really depends how, um, how extreme you want to go. So some key takeaways from here. So the first one is the vulnerability effectiveness that we discussed. Developers spend a lot of time in handling, fixing, prioritizing vulnerabilities. We want to make sure that we can effectively choose for them which vulnerabilities they need to handle. So we need to make sure that they handle the effective vulnerabilities, the ones that are actually being referenced by the source code. The second one is automation is, is the key, and we heard it a lot in the last three days of the conference. So it's all really about automation. We see customers who are trying to implement um, some manual processes and stuff like that. It really doesn't work if you want to deliver your software fast. So I really believe in implementing everything into the pipeline. So baking the security management into the pipeline as process-driven security will help me to achieve the results a lot better and will eventually make me make my software a lot more secure. That's it from my end. I would be really happy to answer every, any questions. Um, we have a booth right outside, so if you have any specific question or like something that you want to hear about, so feel free to come. But if you have any questions now, I think we have some time, right? Yeah, if anybody has a question, just walk up to the bike. Now you make it scary. <laughs> Thank you.